Okay, well, my journey, my journey with the seeds, really, in the whole Koanga Institute, began with. Um, I mean, I've always been a gardener, and I've always been an organic gardener. But when I read Bill's books, Permaculture One, Bill and David's books, Permaculture One and Permaculture Two, um, I got totally inspired. I really loved those books, and they totally um, opened up a whole new world for me. And so I did the first, Bob and I did the first permaculture design course in New Zealand in 1984. And we all had to do a research project as part of the PDC. And I chose to do a, a design, an orchard design for the new orchard we were going to be planting when we um, built our new house on, on the farm in Kaiwaka. So as part of that process of doing an orchard design, I realised I was going to have to go home and find fruit trees that would work in a situation where they were happy, well they were happy with um, organic management of the soil and they would require minimum maintenance and looking after and they would be healthy and give, give me healthy fruit. And I saw in the area I was living that um, most people had stopped growing fruit trees whereas in the 1950s everyone had an orchard and a garden, there were basically none left. And the reason the older people all said they weren't still growing fruit trees was because it was too hard to look after them these days. So I thought about that and I, and I had noticed that there were lots of wild fruit trees growing all around the Kaipara Harbour, which is the area I was living. And so I went on an amazing journey collecting heritage fruit trees for the orchard I was about to plant. And out of that journey came an amazing collection of fruit trees, which... Um, I'd never heard of or seen before, they tasted way better than anything in the shops and it became obvious that I needed to look after these trees and keep them alive and so I started a nursery to make them available to other people. So that was kind of my first step. Um, then, one, the year of that Russian nuclear disaster, Chernobyl, I went, in New Zealand we have a um, an annual farmers field days where all the a lot of farmers go every year and all the latest gadgets and gear and technology is all available for them to look at and buy and I went there with my mother-in-law and I walked into the seed tent so this is in 1984 was it the year of Chernobyl it was around then anyway and the man in the seed tent at that time told me I had four young children at that time and he told me that the only seeds we could buy in New Zealand that were actually grown in New Zealand were Pukekohe Longi for onions. And he said all the rest came from Holland. Well, at that point, Holland was under a nuclear cloud and um, the northern, large parts of the Northern Hemisphere were affected to a large degree. And I, I was just shocked. As a mother of four young children, I couldn't have imagined a more powerless position to be in. And I, when I went away from there, I knew that I had to do something about it, and I had no idea what. I'd never heard of seed saving. I'd never heard of heritage seeds. I'd been just working on my own with the fruit trees. I wasn't aware that there were other people around the world at that same time doing largely very similar stuff. And um, the thing that happened next, which was part of the journey, was... When I moved to Kaiwaka, when Bob and I moved back to his family farm, we moved in, into a really traditional farming area, like right wing, really traditional farming area where the, the locals would only speak to you if you'd been there like three generations. <laughs> and they'd speak to Bob and they wouldn't speak to me. So I, was, I had friends in the same situation, so we thought, what can we do? So we joined the local garden club. And the, my very first visit to the garden club this woman came straight up to me and she said, oh, you're that lady that saves the fruit trees, you might like these bean seeds. And she handed me some Dalmatian bean seeds, which immediately made me realise that if we had old seeds um, from our own families and from our own land, this is obviously where they're going to be. I mean, I just had never thought about it. And so it became obvious that, that the, old, the old gardeners were the ones that had the old seeds. So I just started looking. For old seeds because I had never seen any old vegetable seeds in the old orchards that I'd spent 10 years traveling and, and journeying around and collecting wood from. So once I knew where the old seeds were I went hard out looking for connections and they started coming in 
and we had a lot of publicity and a lot of television coverage at that time and they just every day in the mail they just flooded in and this is 25 years ago 24 years ago and we very quickly ended up with a huge collection like 800 New Zealand heritage seed lines most of which I'd never heard of in my life before and I grew up in a garden eating out of a garden the stories were amazing the families always passed the seeds with their stories of who they were where they came from the seeds literally contained the stories of those people and I did my best to keep those seeds alive Bob and I were just doing this like ourselves out of our own was part of our own business but when the seed thing started happening we realized this was way bigger than us and it was really important and we, so we decided to put the whole, that, the whole saving our heritage food plants into a, a charitable trust and we created the Koanga Institute. Koanga is a Māori word and it means springtime, new beginnings, new growth and we put it into a charitable trust and we have IRD status and um, that has enabled various people and organisations to support us over the years and we've had a lot of support and we worked hard with the seeds until well we still are but there was sort of there's been different stages of it i got a uh, 10 years ago so that's about 2000 and actually i think it was 1999 so it's 12 years ago now i got a winston churchill scholarship to study seed saving in america and and um that was a wonderful opportunity and we went to Seed Savers in Iowa and we went to Seeds of Change in um, Santa Fe and in Gila and the gardens in Gila with Rich Picararo and all my heroes from the, from the Seeds of Change book, all my mentors and heroes. And, but we came back from there really depressed and it, took me, it actually took me three years to write the report that I had to write. And, and part of that process was that we came back from the US feeling like Collecting seeds and having gardens that save seeds and holding these seeds and spreading them around doesn't necessarily save the seeds. To save the seeds we actually have to save the gardeners and we have to recreate um, that process that 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 process that our ancestors were all in, that relationship that our ancestors were all in with their environment, the process of co-evolution. Um, essentially, we can't save the seeds unless, or ourselves, <laughs> unless we're back in that process step of co-evolution where we grow our food, we save the best seeds, the seeds are dependent on us, we're dependent on the seeds, and we re-enter that process of co-evolution. And that seemed like too big. How, how are we ever going to do that? So that was the point at which we committed to um, a much stronger education program and teaching what we'd learned and sharing it with others and especially um, we began the, the apprenticeship program. We, we see that the old apprenticeship program where you have apprentices, journeymen, master, the whole, that whole process is a really important part of recreating sustainable living because it actually takes years to pass on information and you have to be in one place for a long time and you have to learn to be in relationship with your environment and become part of the process to, to, to step on from being an apprentice to a journeyman to a master. So, so whilst we're still saving the New Zealand heritage food plants, the, the, the fruit trees, especially from the northern bioregion, and, and the national seed collection, we are also a, a really an other important part of what we're doing is our education program and we're really focusing now on um, our 10 week internship programs where people live with us for 10 weeks and it's a really intensive um, learning in the classroom and practical outside and out of, out of a few of those um, interns will potentially become um, apprentices and um, and our PDCs, which are the introduction to the whole thing, we, we are really aiming for, our, P, our PDC program is really focused around um, design, teaching people, uh, we've got a really strong design, a team of designers who have been practicing for a long time and we teach people right from day two, we're, we're doing design, so we spend a, put a lot of energy into doing design work and we cover the, um, the, the internationally recognised curriculum. 
But apart from the saving the seeds and the food plants and the education, we also have a we have a third leg, and the third the third leg has become the research programs, and we've got two really major research programs going on, which then feed into the to the education program and to taking to supporting the whole um, movement around sustainable living, creating new ways of living on the land. So Bob runs the um, research program for appropriate technology. Um, the building and appropriate technology where we're learning to build, we're learning to do things legally with our council so that other people can do this too. And we're doing, we're, we're learning to do low cost, to live simply, build autonomous houses or retrofit existing houses simply for low cost using local materials. And that's really exciting. Um, yeah, I mean, we've, it's all there now, just, just putting it together and tweaking it for every different environment and different sets of resources. Really, really exciting stuff. And the area that I'm leading the research for is the connections between soil health, plant and animal health and human health. Um, and we specifically support the Western Price Foundation. Um, we believe that the work of Western Price is hugely, or well, it's absolutely invaluable for our future and we are learning to eat a, a local, simple, seasonal diet based on the principles of all indigenous people who all followed the same principles. And we're connecting that up with the new science of epigenetics, which shows us that environment determines genetic expression, and which is a really empowering thing to understand and to know. And so how we can combine that with, with Western prices, who, who agreed with that, um, and with biological agriculture or regenerative agriculture, combine it together so that we actually um, we understand what's happening in the soil, the principles, the laws of nature, the patterns in our environment, and we can choose appropriate strategies and techniques so that we're building soil, growing really nutrient dense hybrid food, and which can maintain our DNA, which is um, an absolutely vital key in the whole. Um, permaculture link. So here now in Kotari village, the institute actually sits within the village but the village came out of the institute. The, 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 um, the village is essentially Bob's design and Bob's dream and out of Bob's head along with all his connections around the world. But essentially, as part of our process of learning to understand that we can't save the seeds without saving communities and um, recreating that process of co-evolution, I mean, a part of that is learning to live in community again and work together again. And we had already been through the process of turning our family farm into an eco-village, and we saw that there were limitations with the, sh the shape of eco-villages, and Bob wanted to take another step, go further, and learn more and put on the ground what he saw as being more or as being better than the eco-village shape essentially. So he did the research within the institute research program around sustainable living and we um, got the support through the institute, the financial support through institute connections to, to get this land and now he's created all the legal documents and legal structure to create the community to put the community land trust into New Zealand law and that's essentially been done and so now the institute just has a place within within the village and so um, it's a it's a part of the heart of the village really because there's, there's so much the institute can offer the community but essentially we can't save the seeds or do anything without a community. Um, that's a really good question because we actually spent 30 years trying to work within the system to change it and we actually came to the, con we, stepped, we walked away from it and we, we came to the conclusion that what we need to do is create a model um, that works for us in this place and, and open our doors to other people. I mean what we're seeing around the world now is um, two generations of people who, of young people who have grown up disconnected from their environment so they actually 
you can do a permaculture design course and you can get your head around it, what needs to happen, but unless you're able to see the patterns in the landscape, and unless you are still are sensitive to what's actually going on in your environment, it's pretty hard to become a um, good designer because you have to combine the principles and the patterns to choose your strategies and techniques. And what we see is a lot of young people who understand there needs to be a paradigm shift, understand their need they, they want to be part of it, they really want to be part of bringing in a new way of living but they really struggle because they haven't grown they haven't grown up in the natural world and in the environment and so having models on the ground um, with, which have research centres and education centres where these people can come and stay for I mean beginning with like maybe a PDC, um, a 10 week internship and potentially longer internships or apprenticeships there's just a huge demand for that. When we when we put up our apprenticeship um, opportunities on the internet and internship opportunities, we I mean we get hundreds of applications from all around the world, and it's really hard. I mean you can see what's going on. There are a lot of young people out. There's a huge need for models, for for models of community of of living on the land in a simple, sustainable way, research and education. And so it's been really exciting teaming up with Jeff and Nadia from the PRI in Australia and Mustafa in Turkey. And I don't really know the others yet, but but there's a strong link between. We've all we've all got like models. We're all setting up models. We're all in the process. It's always a journey. Um, research centres and education centres. And support, and, and really importantly, um, networks for supporting each other. So, I mean, we're sharing, te Jeff, Jeff's coming over here to teach, and we're going over there to teach, and Mustafa's trying to get us to Turkey, and we're setting up networks for teaching, and I know they already exist around the world, but convergences where group country, people from different countries get together and buy, and, 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 and like, say, the, the Aust Australasian one that's happening next week, and the one we just had in Jordan, which was the International Convergence, building connections and bridges between the people with the skills who are doing amazing work around the world. Sometimes it's hard to see in the media. So um, getting to see that those people exist and this amazing work is happening is a really important part of, of, of the future shape. And so the websites that have been constructed, the PRI website, which is I mean, where we go for our good news and our inspiration, and the, global, the Permaculture Global website, uh, are really amazing um, opportunities for connecting with the best of the stuff that's happening around the world, the best, the best designers and the people that are doing, making really amazing changes. So young people, so we can actually, as teachers and as mentors, we can support each other. And so the young, younger people or the people who are wanting to learn how to make these shifts, how to become part of the new paradigm, how to bring it in, can see where to go and, and how to choose where they, where they need to go to learn what they need to learn. So it, it feels like we're in the process all around the world right now of setting up, um, of putting in place the, the infrastructure for um, international networking and support networks and education centres and research centres and, and community models and it feels really exciting. So the heritage seed collection that we hold basically holds the history of this land and the, the history of the people of this land. Um, there were people here before, obviously before we call ourselves Pākehā, we, the white, pe white Europeans in this land. Um, Māori people were here before us and uh, there is an understanding there were others here before that. And so when the Europeans arrived, um, essentially the Māori at that stage were um, a combination of hunter-gatherer and um, agriculturalists. They, they, did, they did grow some crops, they had uh, an, a, a huge range of um, heritage, well the old kumara and um, I believe they also had, also had potatoes, a limited range of potatoes and, um, and other, other greens that, that kind of grew, travelled with them and kind of grew wild around them. But Coomera were a major, um, commercial, a major commercial food crop of the Māori. Um, when the Europeans came, of course they came on their waka, which were different to the Māori waka, but they also contained their most sacred things, which were of course their seeds, their food plants. And most of our ancestors came from Europe, 
but in particular England, Ireland, Scotland, um, and wi the wider Europe, wider Europe, um, mainly England, Ireland, is mainly the British Isles. Um, and they brought all their favourite food plants with them, and the boats or the boats stopped on the way as well. So the boats either went through the Americas or um, stopped in South Africa, and they all. They picked up um, seeds everywhere they stopped. So when our ancestors came to this land, they actually had an enormous collection of um, f seeds with them. And obviously they just planted them all and whatever did well, they kept going and passed it around and shared it around. So what we've ended up with in New Zealand is a, a, a really wide range of, of, of vegetable varieties and cultivars that have come from all over the world and essentially we've got we've actually got probably more heritage vegetable lines left in New Zealand than well I know we have than than what they have in England we've got the English we've really got the British Isles sea collection here um, I mean 10 15 20 years ago I understand they only had 80 lines of seeds left in England that w they knew were older than 80 years and we've got hundreds of them so essentially they've adapted now to New Zealand soils and New Zealand conditions and, and the lives and gardens of our own ancestors but I actually see that our seed collection is potentially extremely valuable in terms of being a resource for the world again at some point. People who've got um, similar climates and similar latitude. So yeah we've got, we've got a huge seed collection and we have a network of growers and we have we're building isolation gardens here now so that we can maintain some of the harder lines like the cucurbits and the brassicas and we are learning to grow our seeds to be high bricks plants and seeds so that they are they're better quality seeds all the time i mean it's a journey about saving the seeds learning how to do a better job of selecting and saving the best seed and it's all into, it's all become interconnected with all the aspects but the seed collection is um for, for example, we've got a large collection of pre-European potatoes um, and some early, early European potatoes, which are hard to find. We've got a large collection of um, pre-European kumara, which are all sh colours and shapes and sizes and they all taste different. Um, um, huge collections, of course, are the things that have always been easy for people to save, like most of the beans and tomatoes and lettuces are easy so there's lots of them but the things that are hard like the brassicas and the carrots are, are more limited ranges. Um, but it's a, it's a really exciting collection and the more I learn about epigenetics and growing nutrient dense food and regenerating the soil the more I realise how valuable these seeds are for our future and, um, and, and the more I realise how important it is that um, we focus on um, shape that brings young people can come and be in and learn from because it's their future.